the pastors here. It's awesome to have you along. Uh, you can turn to your neighbor, but don't shake their hand. Just give them a, a sterile high five. That's where you don't, that's where it's just, you go for the high five, but then you stop because you want to keep it nice and safe. <laughs> um, but this morning, um, uh, it's really good to be here. Amen? Amen. <laughs> it's good to be amongst fellow believers, amongst an encouraging community. And um, today, I want to talk to you about building peace. So everyone say peace. Peace. Uh, it's, it's something that I find fascinating. And today, we're going to go on, to be honest, a journey um, through... <laughs> quite a lot of parts of the Bible. So today, if there was a day you were going to start taking notes, today's the day, trust me. Um, notes will be helpful today. You want to write down a bunch of these references. So if you want to do it on your phone, or if you have a notepad and pen, that'd be really good. Um, but to start off, uh, I'd like to just pray one more time. Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to hear your word, Lord, to grow to take another step towards you in the journey that you have for us. And I pray that every single one of us today here would be impacted. We invite your Holy Spirit to fill this space and that every single one of us today walks out differently than we came in because we've had an encounter with you, Jesus. We pray all of this in your amazing name and all of us said together, Amen. Amen. Um, so I want to share, I mean, there's a, um, a website that I've liked to go on for a long time. It's called Reddit. Maybe some of you know it, but it's basically got a bunch of themed pages and people contribute to it and share things. And there's one that I've always gotten a little bit of joy from, uh, but also a little bit of frustration, and it's called Mildly Infuriating. So it's basically pictures of things or videos of things that aren't enough to really cause outrage, but just enough to make you feel a little bit frustrated, if that makes sense. So I'll show you a couple of examples um, the first is this sign. Um, so at first it just looks like a normal sign until you realize that the uppercase P is where the lowercase P should be. Does that make sense? So now every time I see it, I get frustrated because I realize the big one that's supposed, they're in the wrong place. And every time I see it, it just kind of, you know, I feel a little bit infuriated, right? Maybe that doesn't resonate with some of you. So the next one is um, a picture from a, like a Google satellite sort of thing looking at a street. And if you look at it, it's like everything is perfectly in line except for this one section that's just out. Why? Why aren't all the roads straight? It makes no sense. Who planned this? Whose idea with this? I don't know. And you see, I'm starting, like the more I look at it, the more I just get a little bit infuriated, but only mildly, right? <laughs> Or the next one, it's, it's, the picture's not much, but it's the story that comes with it, and it's a man, and he got married to the, the woman of his dreams, and he loves living with her, and it's just amazing. And then all of a sudden, he realized that every time he opened the fridge, he realized that she just doesn't quite screw the lids on everything properly. <laughs> so they're just a little bit off every single time he goes in. And he just said, it's not enough to really bring up, but it's just mildly infuriating, right? <laughs> And the last one, I can resonate with this because I've seen something similar before. I couldn't, get, I couldn't find my picture, but I found one. And these people are just walking through a park, and it speaks for itself, really. Can you see that one brick? I could hear the communal sigh as you all began to notice that one brick. I would never be able to walk in that park again, to be honest. Just, if you can't see it still, see that, see that little spot there? It's... It's, I just want to get a shovel and come back and try and dig it out and fix it, right? But you can't. <laughs> and it's just slightly out of, I know I've probably ruined some of your days by just seeing this, but um, it's just slightly out. And we all have little experiences like, like this, and sometimes we feel a bit like this. Like where it's like something just feels a little bit out of place in ourselves. I shared with you guys a while ago how I felt just a little bit weird because I'd lost my, I, I, my watch had broken. I've gotten a new watch this week. Hallelujah. So the sermon will go on time today. Um, but I just had this weird watch tan and I just felt a little bit weird not having my watch the whole time. But I think all of us at times we feel like there's just a little bit of unrest within us. And I think particularly now we're in a time when a lot of people are feeling unrest. I mean, I, the amount of times I've seen photos on my social media that all the shopping centers in Australia have no toilet paper at the moment. What else could make you feel more unrest than the fact that there's no toilet paper to restock? But the fact that we're going through a little bit of a, some, some health issues at the moment, 
partially the media is blowing it a bit out of proportion, but also, you know, it is, it is a little bit scary for some people. But there's a lot of unrest amongst people at the moment. And so how do we as Christians respond to that? What are we supposed to do in times of unrest, in times when things just feel a bit out of place? In times when it just feels like things aren't running as they're supposed to be running? And interestingly enough, there's a constant promise. It's a really big key theme that floats through um, the whole Bible. And it's very prominent in the teachings of Jesus when he makes statements like, like this. In, in John chapter 14, verse 27, you can turn there in your Bibles if you want. It's a great one to highlight and memorize. But he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What an amazing promise, right? If somebody can offer you peace, peace that's so powerful that your heart will never be troubled again, what an incredible thing to be offered. For me, I look at that and I'm like, wow. But to be honest, in my everyday life, I, I have to say, I still feel troubled at times. I haven't got it all together. Maybe, you know, some of you more seasoned Christians than me, maybe you've got it all together and you don't feel troubled ever. Um, but I'm still working on that, to be honest. I'm working on trusting more and, and feeling that less of that trouble. But what does this peace look like? What does it really look like? What's this peace that Jesus is giving us? Because something we have to remember, okay, the Bible, even the newest parts of the Bible in the New Testament are written at least 2,000 years ago, roughly. And some of the older parts of Scripture are much older than that. And so we have to remember, it's not written in English. <laughs> the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic. And then the New Testament is written in Greek, ancient Greek. It's not quite the same as modern day Greek. But um, so often what we do is we just find what's the closest English word that would represent what they're saying. And often it's, it's quite on point. But sometimes we, we can't match word pictures that they're painting in the Bible. Sometimes there's more context to a word. And we have the same sort of words in English. But sometimes in the Bible, there are, these, there are these words that have a bit of a deeper picture than what our language just on its own can give. Peace is still a good word, and I still think it's the best word we can give. But what we're going to do, I'm going to unpack this word for you. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a bit more context around this word so that you know when Jesus is offering you peace, here is at least part of what he's offering. And I think it's something that we, as followers of Jesus, can share and offer to not just ourselves, but to the world. See, we live in a time of trouble and unrest, where chaos is constantly looming, where the media is blowing things up all the time. And yet, as Christians, we're called to never let our hearts be troubled. We're called to have this supernatural peace that transcends all understanding. And so that is what we're called to have. So we're going to unpack this a little bit. And, I w and again, I would encourage you to take notes. So the first part, um, <laughs> here are the words um, that we translate as peace. In the Old Testament, you get shalom. And then in the New Testament, it's arene. So um, obviously, you don't have to write out what they look like in the original language. That was just so you know. <laughs> but um, I just thought they looked nice. So you know, why not share it? Um, but both of these words also like, have different textures, but most of the context comes from that Hebrew word shalom. Everyone say shalom. shalom. Now, interestingly enough, this is still a word very commonly used, even I mean, in Jewish communities especially, but even in Adventist communities. So, I mean, there's been plenty of times where I've gone to church, and if you're new, you might find this very strange, and even if you're not new, you might find it a little bit strange, but people will come up and say, Shabbat shalom to you. How you going? <laughs> uh, it took me a long time before I knew what they were saying, to be honest. But basically, it's, it also pairs as a greeting in the Hebrew language. But what they're really saying is, peace be with you on this Sabbath day. So there you go. You can use that anytime you want. Shabbat shalom, everybody. <laughs> or they, and even just as a general greeting, a Jew will still today often say shalom. And that's just peace to you. And you know, we have words like that. Um, I know in, in Māori you can say like tenakwe, and it's, it can be a greeting, but it also is like, I see you. It's got a bit more than just a greeting. And so this shalom is kind of that, it's a greeting, but it's, it's got a bit more than that. That peace be on you. 
And in the Old Testament, right through to the earliest meanings of it, when they would use the word shalom, it actually comes from the idea of if you're building something, you needed to find a rock, right? A good stone with no cracks or dents in it, right? And that rock was shalom. It was whole and it was complete. And then eventually, maybe something that we would find more, more relatable is the idea of shalom meaning like a wall, but every brick is in its place, unlike that picture that we saw. Every brick is in its right place. Interestingly enough, when, um, when King Solomon, when he finished the wall, you see this in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 25, three times a year Solomon used to offer up burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar that he built to the Lord, making offerings with it before the Lord. And so he finished, he shalomed the house. When every brick and everything was in its place, the house was shalom. It's like this complicated thing and it's all coming together and now is all working in the way it should. It's shalom. Make sense? A little bit? (laughs) And so that's why when we say the word peace, it's a good word. You could say that the house is at peace. But we don't really use the word like that a lot. But for them, shalom had a very wide range of uses. And it would even go in, I mean, in, in Exodus, when they're explaining how the society is going to work, it talks about if you had, a, if you had a, 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 an ox, for example. I mean, if I had an ox, I'd name her Daisy, obviously. Um, <laughs> and so imagine Daisy gets all angry, Daisy gets out of control, and Daisy runs into the next paddock and tramples a whole bunch of my neighbor's crops and destroys all of them. <gasps> oh, no. Because you've got to remember, crops for them, that's their livelihood. And Daisy goes in, cowbells ringing, destroys everything. My neighbor comes out. My neighbor begins to cry. She sees, oh, no, you've destroyed my entire crop. How? How am I going to make any money? And so what, what's written for us to do is you go and you pay for the damage that's done, and then you go and replant their seed. And what you're doing is you are bringing shalom to your relationship. You are bringing wholeness back. It was out of place. It was cracked. It was, there was a problem with it. It was damaged. But you are going and bringing wholeness and completeness again to that relationship. You are restoring the neighborhood between you. I hope this is making more sense. And so this shalom, while it's also used for buildings and relationships, it could even be used for entire kingdoms. That was the idea that, Jesus, that God had with having a chosen nation, with having Israel. He wanted them to be the best neighbors to all of the other kingdoms. A lot of the stuff that we read in the Old Testament might seem really dated and strange. And why do you need instructions for that? Isn't that common sense? No. <laughs> um, common sense isn't that common, funnily enough. Um, but he would write out all of these things, and when you compare the way God wanted Israel to run, it was radically different and radically kinder than, to people than any of the other neighboring nations at the time. It's revolutionary. And he wanted them to stand for, here's what good humanity looks like. He wanted Israel to be the best neighbors and to not just be a great nation, but to be a blessing to all of the other nations. That's what God wanted for his people. And in a way, he still wants that today. He still wants his people to be a blessing to all of the other people, right? And sadly enough, Israel failed to do that. They never brought shalom between them and the other nations. That's what he wanted for kingdoms to make agreements, for Israel to come along and to bring wholeness between them and such a good relationship that they even try and benefit each other in their relationship. That was the wholeness that he was looking for. But the kings of Israel, they often got greedy and never brought it along. As we've seen, so often power brings corruption. And it's such a tragic story that we see unfold again and again and again and again throughout history. And interestingly enough, we go to the book of Isaiah, and there is a prophecy. And there's a prophecy that one day there will be a king who will bring this shalom. If we read this together, if you go to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7, a great, again, a great passage to remember. Write it down, put it on your fridge, whatever it is. Put it on the front of your diary. 
For to us a child is born. So it's, it's talking in the future tense. It's like, for us a child will be born. To us a son will be given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, he will be no end. So he will be a prince of shalom. He'll be the prince of bringing this wholeness and completeness that our societies are missing. And he will bring it in such a way it'll be so strong that it will continue to increase and will have no end. And we still look forward to that great day when God, Jesus comes and brings ultimate peace. Amen? I can't wait. But even for now, he's given us a taste of it and what he's given us already. And he's called us. And so Jesus comes and he brings peace. He shows people a whole new way of being human. And I love the way Paul writes it in Romans chapter 5, verses 1. See what I mean? We're going through a whole lot of places. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Do you see what Jesus did? Much like if my pet ox, Daisy, went and trampled and, and, and did something wrong and brought damage between me, the relationship between me and my neighbor. We, as humans, had done something damaging to our relationship with God. We had overstepped our boundaries, we had disobeyed Him, and we had brought distance between us. And so Jesus, much like what they were called to back in Exodus, Jesus comes and He brings restoration. He pays the cost for our bad deed, for our irresponsibility, for our mistakes. Jesus comes, he dies on a cross, and he pays that ultimate cost for us and brought shalom to our relationship with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He paid the price. He brought reconciliation. He is the prince of shalom. Isn't that incredible? But the story doesn't stop there. <laughs> it does keep going because he gave us a whole bunch of commandments and one in particular. I love this. And this is one I want you to really take away from today. If you're only going to take one verse, let this be your verse, okay? Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. So there's a difference here between peacekeepers and peacemakers, right? A peacekeeper is going to bury their head in the sand and pretend like nothing's happening and just try and make sure everything's okay on the surface. A peacemaker isn't afraid to go in and make peace, to face the hard things, to have the hard conversations, to go in and talk to the neighbor who they've just made the mistake with, <laughs> to pay the cost required, to plant new seeds, peacemakers. He wants the children of God to be peacemakers. So if you today would call yourself a follower of Jesus, if you would call yourself a Christian, if you would call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist, then it is your responsibility to be a peacemaker, a shalom maker, an irene maker. It is your job to go and bring shalom, to bring wholeness, to bring completeness again to places where there is damage, where there is mess to be cleaned up, where there are broken hearts that need mending. And unfortunately, Christians sometimes get a bad rap. We're the ones bringing the least peace. <laughs> We're the ones hyping up things bringing out all the problems in other people, pointing out the flaws, pointing out the cracks in the rock, pointing out the mistakes of others. But that's not what we've been called to do. We've been called to bring them out of that, to help them with it, not to point fingers, not to scream at them, but to love them and bring them out of it. Peace isn't easy. Let's be honest. It's not always easy to bring shalom. It's not always easy to bring wholeness and completeness. 
it can be a hard task. There are people who do not like wholeness and completeness. There are people who like the outrage. There are people who like the chaos. There are people who just want to stay there in the chaos to even make a buck off the chaos. But there are a whole lot of people trapped in the chaos. There are a whole lot of people who think chaos is all we have. They see an issue like what we have today and they think, is this all there is? Is all I have what's in front of me? Is all I have the chaos that I see? Is there a way out? Is there someone who will bring me peace? Is there someone who'll bring rest to my heart again? And if you're a follower of Jesus, you know the answer. (laughs) Yes, there is. (laughs) There is one who when there's storms, when there's chaos, he can step in and silence the storms. And as we get to know him, as as we surrender our lives over to him, and we recognize that we are saved through the actions of Jesus. He's brought reconciliation. We realize that there is shalom in our lives. That it is well with our soul. It is well with our innermost beings. That every brick is in its place. Every stone is where it should be. Even if at times there is chaos and there is storms, everything is where it's meant to be. The hand of the creator of it all has it all in his hand. He has placed you where you need to be right now. Like a brick in a complicated wall. (laughs) He has everything working. And yes, there are decisions that people make that seem to throw things out of balance. But if we would come back to the creator, to the Prince of Peace again and ask Him for that peace. He can give that to you. So whoever you are, whatever your week has been like, whatever your month, whatever your year has been like so far, whatever your past decade has been like, whatever your life has been like thus far, this peace that we talked about, that promise right at the beginning, that is on offer for you here today, right now. If you would ask Jesus, that Prince of Peace, for that shalom, for that wholeness, for that peace again, He'll give it to you. He's given it to me. Yeah, I still have troubles with it. I still, I still wrestle. But He's given it to all of us here. So many people here, if you asked around, could testify that yes, when I had chaos, when I was in a storm, in the midst of it all, when I prayed, I found peace. I found true peace. And I'm sure if we went around the room, there's a whole lot of people who would testify to that right now. So I'm going to invite the team to come up and sing. We're going to sing a song together. And we're going to testify again that it is well with our soul. That there is a peace like a river that runs, that's been running since the days of old, since that Old Testament, and it is still running today, and it is here for you, if you're willing. So as we sing, I would love you to just offer your hearts again, to surrender to that peace that Jesus has for you, to ask for it once more.